gave in and we go, oh, I'm a hopeless listener. I don't listen to people. And we spend our whole <laughs> life allowing who we are to be dictated by according to the other in, you know, insinuations of other people or the statements that other people make about us or the way people treat us. And this is the only way we get any sort of rough guess as to who we are. We don't know our own truth. And so you live a life of emotional mountains and valleys. When people are complimenting you and thinking you're the greatest thing, then you have a great day and the next day something happens and your whole life is affected. You just hit the ground, proverbially speaking. It's a very painful way to exist. And this is what I call the original pain. It started with your parents actually loving you but just following classical cultural ways of bringing up children that resulted in the primordial part of you feeling repeatedly abandoned. That was followed by their loving attempts to mold you into the perfect human being because they actually loved you so much but in doing so they conveyed to you disapproval. And with abandonment and disapproval you believed yourself to be flawed and that pain you've been carrying ever since. Now, I'm not saying that this is true for all of us. Please don't misunderstand me. I wouldn't be so presumptuous. I'm simply saying that in my experience, there is a vast number of people in this collective room, this number of people. There's bound to be a large number who this does apply to. And it's those of you that I'm reaching out to today. If it's not you, perhaps it's information you could share with a loved one who does suffer in this way. But the point is, how does this relate to our food choices? Well... I'd like to explain this. In order to have any understanding of your relationship with food, it's really important that you have an understanding of how your nervous system works. We're talking basic physiology. Your nervous system is a network of pathways that allows your brain to communicate with every cell in your body. It's like a giant telephone network if you want to look at it that way. Whatever is happening in your body on a cellular level is transmitted to your brain whereby that information is processed and messages are sent back to the cells of your body instructing them how to behave. Now this two-way communication runs on something which is effectively a low voltage electrical current. We call it nerve energy. Now, you can pick up a biochemistry book and you can read through all the various chemical reactions that occur within your body to create this charge. But at the end of the day, it's a low-voltage electrical current. And we only have so much of it in our body at any one time. We're using it up in everything that we do, from cognitive thought, digesting food, conducting emotions, athletic endeavours, simple um, basic bodily processes of metabolism, we use it up in forms of conducting our heart rate, our respiration, everything that form goes on inside your body. Everything that you do in your day. Going shopping, putting the shopping in the car, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you're using up nervous energy, cell to brain, brain to cell communication. Now, your body is very well equipped at being able to do many little processes all at once. Now, as I'm standing here in front of you, and as you're sitting in front of me, and standing, some of you, your bodies are monitoring your sodium-potassium levels. Your, your brain, in fact, is monitoring the acid and alkalinity of your blood. Your brain is involved now in actually conducting the process of digestion for the lunch that you just ate. And your brain, of course, is involved in absorbing information that you're hearing verbally from me. And this is all going on at one time. The point is that when it comes down to really big tasks, your body is only designed to do one or the other. Yeah? It's a bit like, you know, us women are known to be multitaskers, right? And so I can stand there, I've learned how to be breastfeeding Francesca and speaking on the telephone and just washing the kitchen floor at the same time, you know, <laughs> has been known. Uh, but if you said to me, look, I want to, you to make a gourmet meal for 18 people at the same time as writing a chapter for your new book and just uh, doing a bit of dressmaking, I mean, whoa, you know, I simply can't do all of that. And it's the same with your body. Now, the two of the most energy-draining things that you can do are digesting food and conducting emotions, right? Now, let's be clear on this. There's a big difference between energy and fuel. People say food gives you energy. Now, if that were true, 
When you took Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner, <laughs> the biggest meal of the day, where you put everything down and in's gone the pumpkin pie and the whatever it might be you have and this, that and the other, and it all goes down. And then of course you have to remember about the after dinner chocolates and everything, just to follow through, you know. Maybe a bit of alcohol, whatever it is you do. And then you sit down. <clears throat> Now, just to prove that it doesn't give you energy, what do you think you would feel like doing after a meal like that if it gave you energy? <laughs> oh, let's go, let's go, can't we go and play tennis or something, or I just want to go for a run, I have so much energy. We don't do that, do we? We pick up the remote control and we go... <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we do. Because it is exhausting on your nervous system conducting those sorts of complex digestive processes. What we do get from the food we break down is fuel, which is completely different from energy. Energy is related to the charge within your nervous system. <clears throat> the only way to charge up your nervous system is through sleep. If you don't get enough of it, you walk around all day like a battery that's slightly run out. And you calculate, you press in two plus two and you get seven and a half. <laughs> Now, if your body is only able to do one thing at a time when it comes to conducting intense emotions or digesting food, we realize that it is literally physiologically possible to eat yourself into a state of emotional numbness. Yeah? Is that anything any of you have become aware of, that it's possible to do that? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> That's right, this is the honesty session. We'll all... Have a sort of policy of confidentiality here, right? Okay. <laughs> now, how it works is this. Take two people who go through a bereavement. One person is so busy, involved in that sorrow and the sadness and the tears and the sense of loss that their brain knows that there is no available nervous energy <coughs> to conduct the processes of digestion. So the appetite will be switched off. And that person will go through the bereavement eating far less than they usually do, just picking occasionally and not feeling hungry and just, you know, bereaving terribly. At the end of that bereavement, they're going to have lost weight. Now we get the other person. And they are so overwhelmed by the whole idea of having lost this loved one. They can't even go there emotionally. It's too painful. And so where do you find them? In the kitchen, in the refrigerator, in the pantry, down the baker's store, wherever it is to get the food. Because if they put enough food in, it works as an emotional analgesic and they cannot feel. At the end of their bereaving, although it wouldn't actually have processed it properly, they would have put on a lot of weight. So it can work either way. Now how many times, unfortunately, do we eat in a way that is not congruent with our intentions and beat ourselves up for it. And by beating ourselves up for it, we're adding to the pain that we're trying to anesthetize. So we end up eating more because it's so painful. And then we feel even worse about what we've done. So we have to have more food as an emotional analgesic. And so it goes on and on and on. Yeah? We get on a nasty treadmill, a kind of cycle of behaving in this way. So how do we break this? Well, the first thing that we need to do is that we need to start creating what I call your encyclopedia of truth. And how that goes is like this. You take a quality, any quality that you like. It could be a quality that somebody has accused you of or insinuated is yours, or it could be a quality just that you know somewhere inside you leaves you feeling uncomfortable. Let's take, for example, that one I used earlier about being a good listener. Yeah? Let's take that as an example. What you do is you take that quality to court and first of all, you wear the hat of the prosecutor and you list down all the actual evidence that you've got that you're not a good listener. Okay? Now, it's no good saying, you know, because somebody told me I wasn't or, or because I don't think I am. It's got to be the sort of evidence that would stand up in court. You know, Wednesday, 2.30pm, friend calls up to talk about divorce, told her I simply hadn't got time, put the 